Well guys, it's truck day today. I want to start on this cat truck. We're pulling this CT15 out. That's going to be a separate video. We're going to pull the hood off of it today and start pulling the cooling package and we're going to pull the engine out and it's going to get a B model cat in place of this Navistar pile of shit thing that's in here. That's going to go away and get a reliable engine put in it. And this, this is a log truck with a DD15 Detroit in it. And the problem with this one, as you can see antifreeze all over the ground. I don't know if you can see that or not. There's antifreeze back in here on the ground. Okay, this cooling module, they call it, or oil foster housing, cooling module, whole shit and caboodle thing. Anyways, this right in there, this is the housing. It's all part of this whole assembly that goes around here. Uh, this has got electrolysis in it. It's got a pinhole in it, and it squirts water. When you start it, it'll it'll squirt clear out to here and get you wet. So, twenty eight hundred dollar part. So I'm gonna start gutting this thing. I got to get save what antifreeze we can, and. Uh, what, what the deal is, this antifreeze was recently changed. I put a EGR cooler on this thing not too long ago. There's the new cooler right there. So what the deal is with this truck is he bought this truck used and put the log gear on it. And when he got it, he saw a lot of evidence in the cooling system of them running straight water in it. They must have had some cooling problems, some leaks or something in the radiator or something. And he said that they'd had, they, you could tell that they'd been pouring water in it. So that's probably what caused all this. So, you know, you, people just don't understand that antifreeze is, serves more than one purpose. It's more than just a, to keep it from freezing. It, it's an inhibitor. It's a rust inhibitor. It, if the... If it has DCA in it, which is uh, an inhibitor for electrolysis, there's a lot of things that it does. It keeps things from rotting out and rusting out. So these guys that pour straight water aren't too sharp. So let me get some clean buckets, start draining the antifreeze out of it. Okay, we're draining the antifreeze. Alright, so I gotta get this hose off right here. Uh, I wonder if I can just kind of pull it all off on assembly. There's quite a bit of stuff attached to this intake pipe. We get our crossover and this bracket here. screwdriver and then this tube here is bracketed right here that needs to come loose 
10 millimeter there. And then we need to unplug that underneath there. I'm trying to get the camera propped up here in the right spot. Maybe you can see it right here. I'll sit it right on top of the light. Yeah, that'll work out. It's gonna screw me. Yeah, it's gonna screw me. I gotta get either a ratchet, my little cordless ratchet, and get that off. So let me go get some tools and I'll be back. a little bit I don't I just can't figure out this younger generation and this sense of entitlement that everybody owes them a job and owes them a living and then they don't even have to fulfill their end of the bargain when they make a deal with somebody I don't understand that it seems like there's no integrity with these people anymore they just I guess you really can't blame it on the generation. You gotta blame it on the people that are raising them, I guess. Which would be my generation. <laughs> Makes you wonder, you know, you can't can't teach your kids any values, you know. I don't know. I'm still kind of cutting my teeth on them. They're different, that's for certain. The way they do things. I would say that's like the manifold mass airflow or map sensor or something like that. That's what I would think that would be. It's got a bunch of grommets here, zip tied here. Is that? It's all part of that harness there. These plugs. It's long enough to get it apart. I'm gonna have to get these grommets out of here. Okay, what else do we have attached? So this is braced right here. And then I've got to unplug this is it lock in there be careful with these damn things you don't know what it looks like some kind of lock to me Get a pick or something in there to get it loose and get it all off, I guess. I get the hose. Sure that. 
gonna switch buckets here. So it's a little bit off the topic of the Detroit, but I know you guys like to hear me ramble on some of my about some of my things I got going. Uh, been working my tail off trying to get some of these cats done. Uh, didn't video. I've, I'm working on the third cat right now. The second, I'm calling the third cat's the one sitting outside. The second cat is the one with the steering clutches and the track frames out. The first cat's the one that I've already got the tracks on and I'm done with the undercarriage work. Uh, the first cat, I've got to pull the valves out of the controls that control the hydraulics for it. And uh, Joe told me that they had this problem before with it leaking by and they had to have the spool sent off and re-combed. So I don't know. I'll pull it apart and see what that looks like. But I know there was a lot of discussion on the one video that I had that about me. <laughs> the way that that tool that I bought, I bought, it was called a Flans Wizard. And I, I, find, I found out a good purpose and a good use for that tool. Okay, that tool came with a, a sliding soapstone holder that you could mark your line with. So I thought, you know what, why don't I just, that way I don't have to pull those guards off again and mess with that. You know, there was those dust shields that went over the uh, duo cone seals where the center of the hub was. And with that tool being on there, using it as a torch guide to cut, I couldn't really, I couldn't get my tip close enough with those dust shields on. I had to grind the rivets out and knock them out. And so anyway, uh, I didn't want to do that this time. So what I did, as I got to thinking about it, I thought, you know, that thing came with a soapstone holder. Why don't I just lay it on the bench? And that soapstone's six inches long. I can center that, you know, that piece of plate that I made that went in the center of the hub. I can center that, use the magnet and the center punch part to use it as a giant protractor. And I'll, I think it's 24 and three quarters of an inch is the total width, the inside diameter of the new ring that you're welding on. So it's a 12 and three eighths is what you need to be measuring out as from the center of the hub to the outside where you need to cut. So I thought, you know, I'll just, I'm just going to use the soapstone part and just draw a circle around it. And so what I did is I just centered it up. I actually, I laid that, that flange wizard thing on the bench and I pulled that soapstone holder out and with the thumb screw and I set it at 12 and three eighths. And then I set it up on the magnetic base, drop my soapstone down and I just drew a circle around it. And then I just... I, that my new forklift, I raised, I put the sprocket on it. I laid it up to the exact height of where I was comfortable with the torch. And I just freehanded it and just followed the line. And what I did, I was trying to factor in the width of the cut of the tip. So what I did is I just basically just stayed right on the line. And that was going to kind of factor in the width of the cut for the tip. And it actually turned out really, really good. Uh, those two sprockets went so smooth compare in comparison to the previous two. It's like I said, I've never done those weld-on sprockets before. That was the first sets I've ever done. And a lot of people were asking and making comments. I don't know why you're... It's it's has nothing to do with the money it, of this of this weld-on sprocket being cheaper. It, it's the, the soul... The, this whole thing is what we could get. I got my parts through track, man, and Rusty could not get, well, he could get the pressed on the whole sprocket, but he couldn't get it in the timeline in which I wanted. He was telling me like April or May, and I said, dude, these things got to be ready in the field by March. I can't dick around here. And he said, well, the only thing I can do, you know, to get you going in a hurry is I can get weld on rings. And I said, well, get them. I'll just, I'll just go that way. So, so if that answers some of your guys' questions or your concerns of why I was doing that, that's why I couldn't get the other ones in, in, the, in a timely manner. I could get them, but just not in the time in which I wanted them. So anyway, after I did that, and uh, another thing another thing I wanted to go over with you guys. So, you know, I, I hooked up my 
LN25 Lincoln welder. And see, it's been a long time since I welded that with that welder. And I just forgot. I knew that flux cord had to be reverse polarity. But for some reason, I just thought, when I held, I've never hooked it up to that trailblazer welder that I had. My old welder that I used to run it off of in the F550 was a Bobcat 225. And on that one, I, I know, I remember I switched the leads on it to change polarity. You know, I took the, the stinger and swatched, switched it to the ground and the ground to where the stinger was, to positive. Because on flux cord, you want straight polarity, reverse polarity. So usually like on 6011 or something like that, or 7018, you're running positive polarity. Well, on, on uh, I call it straight polarity or negative. <clears throat> so anyway, hang on a minute. So anyways, that was my better half asking me what I wanted to eat for dinner. So she's on her way home. Anyway, um, back to the welding saga. So on that LN25, I just, I bought that welder when I went out on my own. I had one that I worked for with the company. I used to do a whole lot of welding and fabricating, believe it or not. That's why the actual name on my door says Butte Valley Welding. That's what I actually prioritized in my business, what I thought I was going to do. But that didn't wind up working out that way when I went on my own I was getting all kinds of wrenching jobs mechanic and jobs so that's what I I went where the money was you know that's what they were bringing me that's what I did so um, I, I welded a couple jobs with that LN25 and that's I only used it a couple times and I just basically forgot how to how to hook it up you know and then I I started messing with these sprockets again then I finally you know on this welder here it has an actual setting for flux core you can either run solid wire or flux core well so I went over to suck flux it actually has two different wire feed settings actually on this trailblazer what is this a trailblazer 325 it's got a flux core for constant current and then it's got a flux core for constant voltage is which what I'm running voltage sensing so anyway I put it on voltage I put it on flux core voltage sensing and it still just didn't you know I got about halfway through one sprocket and I'm sitting there going man something just doesn't seem right it's not welding right it's you know usually when you're welding well even with flux core or uh uh what do they call it? Uh, the uh, gas shielded. It should sound like a. I mean, it should be a nice, crisp sound and sound smooth when you're welding. It just. This was throwing a lot of spatter out there, and it just didn't seem right. I finally, I finally pulled my head out of my ass and figured out what I had to do. I had to take the stingers. I had to take the positive actually on the welder. So take the work, switch it to the ground, and the ground, and put it on the work. And then, then I reversed polarity, and then I went back over there, and it welded so nice after that. And uh, it's just amazing. There's actually a pretty good video I was watching the other day on weld.com. It's on YouTube. And this guy, he showed the current differences between running it on positive polarity at the same voltage. So he had it set up at, like, he had flux core wire. And there's a lot of misconceptions about flux core. A lot of guys say that it doesn't get as good at penetration. You watch that guy's video on flux core wire, and that'll prove you everything wrong. The flux core actually has better penetration than the gas shielding does. Now, you can run dual shielding wire, which a lot of guys around here do. Dual shielding, if you don't know what that is, that has flux core and gas shielding on it. So it's just kind of, I guess it's just extra precaution, I guess. You know, but um, I've never run dual shield. I've all I welded with dual shield on other people's welders. It takes a little bit of getting used to as well. But once you actually get the flux core dialed in the way I did, and you start welding with it, your spatter really there'll be a little. It's almost like welding with 6011. 
you know, it'll be a little bit messy, but the slag cleans off real easy. You know, uh, it's not bad at all. And that's another thing that a lot of guys, they didn't like welding with 6010 because 6010, the, sl the slag was real hard. But anyways, I got the welder dialed tits on and man, it's, it's welding really nice. So the sprockets, I'm slamming through them now. I'm going to have the other cat done tomorrow. I would have had it done today, but this log truck came up. So anyways, I just thought I'd go over some of my findings and, and then I found a, a good use for that flange wizard tool. I think the tool would work fine if you were working on something that didn't have such a high, well, you know, where, where it's sitting on that hub, it's too high. And you can't get your torch hardly low enough to cut right without taking that shield and all that stuff off. I think if you're welding, if you were cutting out a flat piece of plate, say you want you set that center piece on there with the, the center punch hole in it and you wanted to cut a flange out, it's called the flange wizard. So I don't think it's really made for what I'm trying to do with it, for one thing. I think if you just set it down on a piece of 3 8 plate and you wanted to make a flange and cut out your flange with it, I think it would work awesome. So, anyways, thought I'd go over that with you and let you know how I've been progressing on the cat work. So I pulled the coolant filter out of that thing. Look at that thing. Can you believe that? Did they pour a bunch of bar stop leak or something in this thing? What is that shit? That's out of the coolant filter. That's crazy. What in the hell is the deal with that? I'll have to call him and say, better get a, better get a coolant filter. Let's take a look down in that hole there and see what that looks like down in the where the water is. Huh. Well, it's just full of all kinds of that shit. It should all kind of drain down. He's bringing an oil filter, but I gotta get a hold of him and tell him that we need a coolant filter for certain. We can't put that pile of junk back in there. I think we're ready to remove it from the engine now. Let me get my ducks in a row here. I'm gonna go ahead and swap the battery out on the camera here. It's about dead. Let's see what bolts we gotta take loose to get this separated from the engine block. Not really certain right now. Let's see those there. Those more than likely. Roll from there. There's a real long one here. So we're probably gonna have to pull this bracket loose to get on these here. Okay, not too bad. Well, a big snap-on light went dead on me, so let's over there charging, so. I got it loose. Let's see if we can wrestle it out of there now. Jiggy. So 
now we got to undo this water pump and see what where the cavitation and all that stuff came from. So let's zip this pulley off. Put the block back in here. That all looks good. Uh, so let's get the old impact wrench. Where's my 13 millimeter at? Just so pull it off the water pump. The water pump is fairly new. shop it changed it before I worked on it I guess so the oil cooler will have to come out of there so we've got to be careful with that see what I'm doing here it's kind of pointing up yeah I think we'll be all right is there a wedge hole or something in it somewhere to get in there and get the darn thing loose where's me old flat bladed screwdriver definitely see what happened here see the electrolysis that got in here and ate up this housing yeah it's pretty well done for all these sensors and all this stuff will have to come off of it the oil cooler will have to come out of it this block heater will have to come out so let's go ahead and get all that stuff out of there and get it stripped naked yeah it's shot it was leaking right out of here right in this gap water was just squirting out of it just aluminum that's what happens when you get either a bad ground or you get you know and i've heard guys that hauled pipe this thing which i don't know if it ever did before it was a log truck but i heard guys that were pipe haulers that would haul aluminum pipe or steel pipe that if you didn't have that covered over the front, that airflow would go through that pipe and cause electromagnetic energy, which would cause electrolysis in, in uh, engines. I've heard of that too with pipe haulers. So, which makes sense because I used to do a lot of irrigation pipe when I was uh, uh, 
working for the strawberry nurseries and all that aluminum pipe 10 inch 12 inch main line that we'd set on the ground that water flowing through that pipe and that and that pipe sitting on the ground it would do it would do exactly like this right on the bottom it would pit the bottom of that aluminum pipe out and get electrolysis in it and it'd get holes in it from the current because that water would create a current flow through there electrical current so <sighs> i guess uh i might just wait till he gets here with the new part before i start stripping stuff off yeah that's what i'll do i'm gonna go on and have out there and work on my cat